you ready for the word today? Yeah. I want to uh, welcome those that are in the room with us today. Thank you for being with us. Those that are first-time guests, those that have been with us before, thank you so much for, for joining us today. The service was what it was because of your presence. I believe God orchestrates a gathering based on the people that are going to be there. So perhaps something that was saying this morning, something I'm going to say today, it is because God knew you was going to be here. So I challenge you to just really, really uh, uh, connect with the word today. Allow me to speak uh, uh, to you as the Lord has so placed on my heart. And I want to also welcome those that are watching online. Thank you so much for joining us as well. I pray God bless you, whether you're in your home, in your office, or wherever you are. May God bless and keep you. Amen? Amen. Well, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and I'm reading from the NLT, the New Living Translation, <clears throat> so you can read along with me in your Bible, or you can follow uh, along with me. The words should be on the screen behind me. 1 Corinthians 13, and verse 1, Paul writes, If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable, and it keeps no record of wrong or being wronged. Let me, let me read that again. That's so, so powerful. Woo. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. Love does not demand its own way. Love is not irritable. Love keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice about injustice, but it rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy is speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now, knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought and reasoned as a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly like puzzling reflections in a mirror. But then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know now is partial and incomplete. But then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these three is love. Father, I thank you that you loved us so much 
that you sent your only son to die for us. I thank you, Lord God, that you do not leave us to ourselves to figure out how to navigate the, the challenges and nuances of this world, but you sent your Holy Spirit to live in us. I thank you, Lord God, that because of your love for us, you promise to never leave us nor forsake us, no matter what we're going through, no matter how difficult the time, no matter what the challenge is, God, we can live with the assurance that God is with us, that you're near, that you're here, that you're present. And God, I pray that in these next few moments that you would just use me to speak your word. May the people in this room and the people online, God, may they hear what the Spirit of the, God, of the Lord is saying. But God, tune that, make their ears become, allow their ears to become deaf to anything that is not of you or anything that they don't need to hear. So Holy Spirit, have your way. We love you so much. Just move in this place. Bless your people. Just take a moment right where you are and let the music minister to you. Sit quiet before the Lord. Tune your heart to his. Jesus, we thank you for your peace that surpasses all understanding. Let your peace rest and abide in this place. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, Brother Mario. Yeah. Well, this morning, I'm going to start a new series entitled Beyond the Ballot. As we approach one of the most challenging times in our nation and in the church, I feel it is imperative that, 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 I, that we take the time to speak to you about how to navigate these next few weeks, even a couple of months, that's going to put a significant strain on the fabrics of our society. Beyond the ballot. And I want to start this series by speaking to you a message entitled Love Beyond the Ballot. Love Beyond the Ballot. This series, we, we, with this series, we're going to address the challenges that have become so prevalent during our presidential elections. 
God wants us to live unified as believers of Christ. Unified in a nation that is greatly divided over politics. But for that to happen, for us to live as a unified body of Christ, we cannot follow the ways of the world, but we need to show the world the ways of God. Jesus said in John 13, 34, your love for one another, listen, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. And he said in John 17, 21, or in John 17, 21, he prayed for us to be one as he and the Father are one so that the world would believe that God sent him. Do you hear that? Jesus said, based on how the world sees us loving each other, based on how the world sees us living in unity, the world will either believe that he's the son of God or not believe. Wow. Our love for one another proves to the world that we are the disciples of Jesus. And our oneness with fellow believers, testifies that Jesus indeed came into this world to save the world. But the past cycle, the presidential elections have revealed a couple of startling facts about the church. And I'm going to try to walk very gingerly this morning, although it may come across as a very heavy hand. Pray for me, but listen, I'm good to go. Well, with, listen, when it comes to talking about this, I'm good to go. Listen, these are the two startling facts that I've come to, to understand about the church when it comes to the cycles that a presidential election that we've gone through. The first is this. We really do not love or show love as we should, especially to our brothers and sisters who have a different political view than we do. That's a fact. We, let me say it again. We do not love or show love as we should to our brothers and sisters who have a different political view than we do. Number two. Though commanded by God to live in unity, our actions often prove that we're not willing to accept the differences of others that are required for unity to exist. Unity is not uniformity. We're different. We're diverse. We're distinct. But that does not mean we cannot live in unity. Our pastor at Restoration Church through the past four presidential elections, so this is election number five coming up. And what I've, I've, I have observed over the years is the tremendous impact that political elections have on the unity of churches that are diverse. Over the past 16 years, Restoration Church has lost too many good people. We've lost too many good families. We've lost too many strong people of faith who truly love this church because of disagreements or differences surrounding politics. That should not be the case. Therefore, I believe politics have become the most serious threat with, to unity within the church. I believe politics are more divisive than race, more divisive than our cultural distinctions, and more divisive than our denominational differences. I watched people who were once very good friends get so angry with each other over politics that they stopped talking. They stop communicating time after time after time again. And I 
can give you the names because I still see the faces. Brothers and sisters in Christ, stop showing love to each other because of political grievances. And what I've heard people say when they get in that place is this. Well, I can love them from a distance. How many of you have heard that? You said it. Thank you, Pastor Jasper. Come here, brother. Give it up. Give it up, brother. That's a real man right there. He said it. I, I can love them from a distance. How many of you besides Pastor Jasper has said that about someone else? Amen. Maybe not over politics, but something else. I can love them from a distance. Thank you for your honesty. Now, can I step on your toes for a moment? <laughs> Listen to me. A few questions for you. How would you feel if God took that position with you? How would you feel if God said, well, I could just love him or love her from a distance, but I'm not going to get too close? How would you feel if God removed his nearness from you? As Christians, we should not become so deeply entangled in our political views that people cannot distinguish us from the world. Yet that is where we've come to. Many who at one time ran their Christian race so well now allow politics to define them and dictate their behavior. Let that not be so with you. Many who are rooted and grounded in their faith are now blind to certain truths because of politics. Are your political views keeping you from representing God's kingdom well? Are politics more important to you than your brother or sister? In Christ. Wow. Are politics so important that you're willing to disregard, throw away, forget about people that you once thought so much about until you learn they don't believe like you do when it comes to politics. And may I add that you know this, what causes so much division and so much fighting in the church when it comes to politics is social media. Yeah. It's so easy to get out there. It's so easy to type that, those words and push sin without thinking about how is this going to make this person feel. As Christians, we're not to be conformed to the are controlled by the systems of this world or the ways of this world. The world through its advertisements, its conversations, its philosophies is engaged in a gigantic brainwashing that is aimed at confusing and dividing the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Not always consciously, but sometimes unconsciously, the Christian is beset by secular and worldly propaganda, especially concerning politics. So much so that we, we see, we hear, and we read about in today's counterpolitical climate, so much of what we hear, so much of what we see, so much of what we read about in today's caustic political climate is intended to divide and conquer. Right. Yes. Do not be conquered by the world of politics. That's right. It's as though there is some diabolical mastermind affecting the affairs of the world whose chief objective is to confuse God's children about their identity. Where there is. And his name is Satan. But you got to stop letting him use politics to rob you of your true identity in Christ. Before you were a Democrat, a Republican, or an Independent, you were a child of God. Before you were a black man or a black woman or a white man or a white woman, you were first a child of God. That is your true identity. We got to live from that place. But the church suffers from identity crisis. Because we, we've, we've taken the things of the world and we brought them into the church. Now we don't know who to be. With the world one day, with the church one day. And we confuse our children. They don't know what to believe. Because they see us living in both worlds. Jesus said, be in the world, but not of the world. You can, listen, you can do this thing. You really can do it. But you've got to want to. you got to want to. When God looks at your life, I pray that he don't say of you that at one time, you ran a good race. But now you've allowed politics to hinder how you run. Listen. If you do not have it in you to love beyond the ballot, why? Why? What does hinder you? What have you become so entangled with or so entangled over that you can't love beyond the vote that you cast? As for your life in Christ and your po political Views, whatever they are, it is not about being right. But in Christ, it's about being righteous. We spend too much time arguing over what's right and what's wrong. When God's called us to be a righteous people. And the righteousness that God has called us to is a righteousness that will always be expressed in love. Has your desire to be right overwhelmed God's command to love others? Please hear me when I say this. When it comes to us loving one another, God does not give us the option. <laughs> he doesn't give us an option. But he has commanded us to show love. That means we have to love people beyond the vote that we cast. Listen to what Paul said in today's text about love. He said that even if we have the ability to speak like an angel but don't have love, our words are empty and meaningless. Like a noisy symbol. 
We can be the greatest orator in all the universe. We can speak with a thousand tongues and a thousand languages with an eloquence that is the greatest of all time. But Paul said, unless we have love, we're only sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. There are many who understand the Bible. They have the gift of preaching, the gift of prophecy. You can be the greatest preacher who ever lived, yet the Bible says unless you have love, it profits you nothing. Nothing. Suppose we understood all mysteries and all knowledge, read the Bible every day, carried it with us everywhere we went, believed in all the creeds and doctrines, but unless we have love, Paul said we're nothing. Suppose we have faith that, that we can even move mountains. People would say, man, what great faith that is. Yet that is nothing unless we have love. Suppose you were the most generous giver that ever lived. You gave all the money you had to charity. People say, man, that's a, that's a great man. That's a great woman. That's a great Christian. But the Bible says, unless you have love, it is nothing. Do we really love people as we should, regardless of our political differences? And I'm going to say this before I forget to say it because it's not in my notes. You know what something you need to do about politics? Stop talking about it. Just stop it. I'm telling you. Because, listen, because people begin to have these conversations with the intent of proving a point. Are presented an idea. And they want to have these conversations with someone that they know don't think like they think. Yeah. Just stop having the conversations. It creates a safe place. It creates a place where God can be in our midst and in your midst. And it creates a place where you can keep your friends. <laughs> you can really keep your friends. <laughs> Listen, 1 Corinthians 13, 13 says, these three will last forever. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Let me get personal. Come on. Please hear me. You have the right to vote your convictions. But you do not have the right to withhold your love from people whose convictions are different from yours. If we're going to live beyond the ballot, we have to start loving beyond the ballot. As believers of Christ, we are first and foremost citizens of the kingdom of God. But if we're not careful, we can be so easily drawn into the dogma of politics that creates the kind of world and struggles that kingdom people should live beyond. So let me tell you, so you hear it straight from my mouth. As your pastor, I do not believe it is my place to tell you how to vote. Right. Not my place. But this is what I will tell you. Do your homework. Pray and ask God how he wants you to vote, then go out and exercise your constitutional right. Now, I know there are some of you here who believe I shouldn't think this way, 
but I should encourage people to vote a certain way, which I will not do. Amen. Some of you may even go as far as posting on social media that your pastor would not publicly choose the political side. And listen, you don't have to worry about me reading your comments because I don't do social media either. So you can post away. It's okay. It's okay. Now, now listen, I'm, I, I, I'm a, I vote, okay? I exercise my, 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 my constitutional right. But can I tell you why I take the approach I do? Can I tell you why? Because some of you probably won't. Well, why pastor won't say? Let me tell you why. Look around this church. Just look around. Just look around. This is what I know. In this church... We have Republicans, we have Democrats, we have Independents, and we have some people who probably couldn't give two cents about politics. <laughs> and as pastor of the church, I want to know, I need to be able to speak to all of you. Please hear my heart. I need to be able to speak to every person in this church. And if some of you knew I voted a certain way, you'd probably turn a deaf ear to me. So it's more important to me that I'm able to speak to you about kingdom issues than about politics. Yeah. So I choose to live in the political center as far as the church is concerned. That's where you're going to find me. Listen, when COVID became an issue, I lived in the center. When racial struggles became an issue, I lived in the center. When politics was so divisive in 2020, I lived in the center. I have to live there. Because I need to be able to speak to each one of you. And if you come to me wanting to present an extreme side, I'm not going to agree with you about your extreme side. Whether it's race, politics, or whatever. I'm going to speak to you about that person who may live on the other side. Because you got to love that person. You can have all the, you, 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 listen, you got to be true to your conviction. But at the same time, you got to honor the conviction of those who are, that are different than yours. That's how we live in this center. Most people vote based on their personal convictions which God has not given me the authority to dictate. And when we, because when we try to convict someone of something, it usually comes across as condemnation. Therefore, I won't do that. And I'm going to tell you how guarded I am when it comes to politics. My wife don't know how I vote. We'll talk about politics. We'll talk about issues. We'll talk about the candidates. But when I walk in that place and cast my vote, she has no idea how I vote. That's how guarded I am. My children don't know how I vote. And I don't know how some of them vote. They live with their own convictions. And I live with mine. I live in the center. 
Listen. God gave me revelation in 1992 when he so succinctly revealed to me that we as mere humans struggle to live beyond our personal convictions when it comes to voting. That revelation forever changed how I personally view politics. But when I share my revelations from God with you, what was revelation to me may be no more than knowledge or information to you. But revelation that I get from God will always trump the knowledge of man or the knowledge that anyone receives from man. So I live in that space. So get along with God and let him give you revelation concerning the politics of this world. When you do, that revelation, I believe, will move you from a place of judgment to a place of love. It will move you from a place of rejection to one of acceptance. And I'm not talking about accepting their political perspective, but you not allowing your political perspective to cause your love to them to wax cold. Galatians 5, 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by, liberty by which Christ has made us free and not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Too many people have become entangled with the yoke of bondage around politics. Strong political beliefs have become a bondage to too many people. Jesus came to set us free, but not free to not love one another, not free to fall back into the ways of the old man. Yet when it comes to politics, many people forget what it means to be a new creation in Christ. So you got to keep going back to when it first happened. Got to remember what God delivered you from. Got to remember who you used to be and, and not be that person anymore. Before I met Jesus, I had an identity that I was proud of. My identity, you know, when it came to fashion, Brother Charles, I, I had those very uh, nice uh, 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 designer jeans. I had the guest jeans and the joy ass jeans, and I had the little short boots that you wear with it. I mean, you know, that was my identity, right? I mean, that's who I was. That's who I was. But when I met Jesus, that man died. And I've not worn a pair of jeans since the day I got saved. Why? I don't want to be that man no more. Wow. I, get delivered, I got delivered from being that person. I don't want to go back to the thing that God brought me out of. I want to live free. I don't want to live under the bondages of this world, and I don't want you to either. So remember when you first fell in love with him, what that was like. That's right, that's Nothing else mattered. That's right. Nothing else mattered. Hallelujah. You loved him and you loved people. And you want the people to, to know him like you knew him. Oh, that's good. But we live in this world, and the world has a way of, of zapping us of that, that energy and that fervor and that love. That's why Jesus tells us, he said to the church in, in Revelation, I have something against you. Yeah. You've done all these great works. But listen, I've got this against you. You left your first love. In Christ, we're free to do now what was impossible for us to do before, and that is love beyond the ballot. Yes. Because of God's love for us, and because of God's love that is in us, we can show others the kind of love that we cannot generate on our own. 
So let's not use the liberty that we have to promote our personal convictions and fall back into the ways of the old man that Christ has delivered us from. The Bible exhorts us to use properly our Christian liberty, which should always be forged by love. It may be a natural inclination to feel uncomfortable around people with different political views, but we cannot allow our differences to cause us to withhold our love from others. When we do, we disregard clear biblical directions to love one another. And because of the absence of love shown to one another, because of our actions and words used to express our differences, and because many are unwilling to love people who have a different perspective, many in the church feel rejected. Many have left the church over political issues. People who suffer from social, racial, economic, cultural, religious, or political rejection tends to practice identity politics. And what do I mean by identity politics? Identity politics is when people of a particular region think in terms blue state, red state, right? Blue state, red state, regional. People of a, of a particular region, religion, ethnic group, social background, et cetera, they form exclusive political alliances, moving away from traditional, broad-based politics. We've taken broad-based politics, and we've narrowed it down to one or two things that we identify with. That is identity politics. And this is done without regard to the interests or the concern of other people. This should not be the case in the church because our identity is in Christ. Galatians 3, 28 says, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, but you are all one in Christ Jesus. Our faith in Christ should transcend our differences and make us one in him. But we have to be careful to not impose our convictions onto others. And since we're all God's children, we're all God's children if you're in Christ, no one is more privileged than or superior to anyone else. We're all one in Christ Jesus. 1 Peter 3.8 says, finally, finally, all of you have unity of mind. Have sympathy. Have brotherly love. Have a tender heart. And have a humble mind. It is hard to live like this if we allow politics to dictate if and how we're going to associate with other people. Politics are divisive, and people can become very dogmatic about their political beliefs. And people who have that dogmatic approach will have the tendency to show love on a very shallow level if they show it at all. And remember, you cannot love people from a distance. Your love has to be up front and up close. God expects us to show this kind of love towards others, to show the same kind of love towards others that he has shown towards us. Come on, Mario. The kind of love that serves others regardless of their political beliefs. God's love is unconditional, and we should try to imitate that love. The scripture we read today in 1 Corinthians 13 was written to morally corrupt Corinth, where love had become a mixed up term with little meaning. And today, 
I'm concerned that the church is still confused about what love really is and how to love as we should. Yet love is the greatest of all human qualities because love defines who God is and it tells us who we are in God. The virtues of faith, hope, and love are necessary to overcome the political divide. Faith, it is the foundation and the content of God's message to us. Hope creates in us an attitude and a focus for this message. But love, is the action behind that message. And we do not live that message out if we do not live in love. Where faith and hope exist, we're free to love because we understand that God first loved us. But Paul says in the age to come, faith will give way to sight, hope will turn into experience, but love will remain because love is eternal. Romans 5, 5 says the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Read that again. The love of God has been, not will be, has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Thus we have no excuse, church. If the Holy Spirit is in you, you can love as you should. And if the Holy Spirit is not in you, you can invite him in. Amen. So I humbly submit to you that anyone who is not loving others, regardless of the reason why, is not yielded to the Holy Spirit. For we cannot live a life yielded to him and not love. Because the Holy Spirit will cause God's love to flow out of us. God is love. Jesus is love. The Holy Spirit is love. If you're not loving others as you should, especially those with, with different political views than what you have, you're not allowing Christ to live in you as you should or as he wants to. If you do not love beyond the ballot, take a moment and ask God why. God, why can't I love that person that I know is so opposed to what I believe politically? Why can't I love that person? Why do I get so agitated when I read their posts? When I hear them say certain things, why God? Is it because you're not filled with the Holy Spirit? Or is it because you're not being led by the Holy Spirit? I submit to you that I believe it's the second one. You're not being led by the Holy Spirit. Or could it be that you have allowed the God of this world to confuse you as far as your identity in Christ with his schemes and his lies? that only divide and conquer unless you know how to stand in love. Just lift your hands to Jesus right now. And I wanna, I wanna pray with you. I want you to pray this with me. I want everyone to pray this with me. Then we're gonna take just a moment or so and pray for one another. Stand to your feet, if you will, and lift your hands to God. Lift your hands to Jesus. And I want each one of us to just give space and give place to the Holy Spirit right now. Say, Father, Father. everyone pray to me, Father, Father. In, the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I come to you now. And I, and I present my life to you. 
I want to be, I want to be a, vessel a vessel of love. I want people, I want people to, experience your love to experience your love through me. Through me. But God, I know, God, I, know. I, cannot like I cannot love like that unless I'm filled with your spirit and I'm led by your spirit. So Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me, God, with your Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, come and live in me. Take control of my life. Help me to live beyond the ballot. By loving beyond the ballot. Spirit of God, come, sir. Fill me now. Come on. Receive him. Come on, receive him. Receive him. Cry out to him. Say, fill me, Holy Spirit. Fill me with your presence. Fill me with your power. Fill me with your love, Holy Spirit. I need you, Spirit of God. I cannot love like I need to without you. I cannot love like God wants me to without you. Fill me, sir, with your spirit right now, God. Let the spirit of God fall afresh upon your people. Say, Father. Father. Everyone, Father. Father. Fill me again. Fill me afresh afresh. right now now. in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Now I want us to take a few moments and get in prayer circles. If you're visiting with us, we often get in circles of two or three people to just pray for one another. And there's we pray for, for, I want to pray, these are the three things I want to pray for. We pray for God to fill us with the Holy Spirit. I want to pray that we be led by the Spirit of God and pray for God to give us his love for others.